My wife bought this dressmaker's dummy at a rummage sale for five bucks. My daughter claimed it and used it for playing dress up. She named him Nohead. After a long negotiation, I convinced my daughter to let us bring it to the lab where we used Nohead for science. We covered him with layers of tissue mimicking gel and used him to develop technologies for detecting concealed weapons. I'm Professor Mark Hinders, Applied Science Department at William & Mary. Every so often, there's a life-changing event, a world-changing event, like 9-11. If you had asked me on September 10, 2001, about developing technologies for security screening, I would have, would have said, no, there's no business in that. That's not a good thing for PhD students to train in. But by the afternoon of 9-11, we had already started to think through in detail how the kind of things that we knew how to do um, could be applied to security screening at airports. So we do um, ultrasound for medical or structural applications. That's typically megahertz frequencies. But we've begun to explore how kilohertz or tens of kilohertz or hundreds of kilohertz ultrasound could be used for applications in air. In particular, we were adapting technologies to explore kilohertz or tens of kilohertz frequency ultrasound for a robot navigation sensor. And we had adapted some systems in the lab to be able to explore this systematically. We put them on robots that go out and about and uh, explore the world with this new sensor modality. And so, by the afternoon of 9-11, we had already thought through how this technology could be used for concealed weapons detection. What we found, uh, using no head initially, was that um, de detecting a hidden weapon underneath clothing is very difficult um, with ultrasound. The issue is that at some standoff distance, it's difficult to focus the ultrasound with a modest size sensor. If you go high enough in frequency that you can focus, it isn't going to propagate very well, and in particular, it won't penetrate clothing. If you go low enough in frequency that the sound will propagate long distances and penetrate layers of clothing, then you can't focus it. A new technology was just becoming available uh, using nonlinear acoustics. Uh, the devices are called parametric arrays, and uh, this uses the, uh, a nonlinear effect to broadcast pairs of ultrasound frequencies, uh, but then downconvert as it propagates to uh, low frequency, audible range things. And the idea here is this technology can uh, focus, can propagate, um, but then the low frequencies can penetrate, backscatter from what's ever underneath the surface, and uh, that signal then can be picked up with microphones in order to uh, deduce what's underneath the surface. One of the inventors of this technology is Woody Norris. Let me show you a little clip um, from back in the day from uh, um, about uh, his company and his technology. And the main thing that I want you to see from what they were calling hypersonic sound is that you only hear the signal when the device is pointed at you. Hypersonic sound is a technology that allows us to create sound beams that are very tightly controlled directivity wise, very similar to how light is controlled by a laser. Uh, we achieve this by using ultrasonic energy out of an ultrasonic emitter that we generate into the air and we modulate that and create audio out in the air rather than audio coming from the ultrasonic emitter. This allows us to create sound beams that we can use to create private audible spaces where someone can hear sound and no one beside them can hear it. Uh, also, it allows us to create virtual speakers on a wall so that we can consider replacing a surround sound system speakers. The rear surround channels can be replaced by virtual speakers using hypersonic sound. From ship to shore, the opportunities for applying this characteristic to the reproduction of sound are only beginning to be realized. Some of the additional applications that we'll see of this technology in the not too distant future will be in-store merchandising at your local supermarkets, trade show or events, and military. For the supermarket applications, we now have the ability to deliver a very specific cone or message into a particular area of the store without it creating a lot of noise for the entire store. For military applications, they're looking at various things such as ship-to-ship -ship communications where they can deliver a message over great distances. 
There are applications within command centers where they can utilize the technology without the use of headsets. And there are also various counterterrorism measures. Okay, so we purchased the commercially available devices. There are a couple of different um, versions of them. Uh, actually, three different versions we, we purchased. Uh, and we started systematically exploring uh, what they could be used for. Uh, some we did outside, uh, where we um, propagate the signal, look at the reflection back from various things. We also did um, controlled tests inside. Uh, we happened to have, uh, where my lab was at the time, uh, a big open empty room with even the ventilation turned off so it was very quiet and we could go in that room and uh, take um, measurements of targets, um, uh, simulated weapons, uh, simulated explosive and, and all sorts of things in order to begin to understand the backscatter from them. The, uh, 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 another key part of, of that work was supercomputer simulations of both the nonlinear propagation of the acoustic beam uh, as it converts from the pair of ultrasound into the one low frequency beam uh, and then interaction scattering of that uh, um, uh, acoustic beam um, with a target. And let me show you a couple of these simulations. Um, the one that uh, most people find most interesting is uh, the backscattering from a person. And what Kevin Rudd did was read into his simulation the complete data sets from the visual, visual human slice by slice to make a three-dimensional model of a human with tissue layers and whatnot. Um, and then we could put uh, um, uh, uh, simulated uh, weapons and whatnot on that to, to look at the backscattering. We also um, had targets that we simulated targets that we uh, um, that we used uh, in this work. Uh, and then at one point together with our partners at Luna Innovations and Applied Research Associates um, we had built a custom uh, parametric array that had some physical curvature to it that would help to focus um, the beam at uh, um, I think 15 um, meters was the was the, the target distance. But when when it was uh, um, hidden explosives, uh, uh, hidden explosive belts, that was the issue. The people in this line of business um, defined what they call a lethal radius, which I s take to mean that if you blow yourself up, you don't get on me. But the point is, they had a very specific distance that they wanted us to detect the hidden explosives um, at. So we built a custom system that could do that, and here you'll see Mark McKenna um, volunteering to um, uh, be scanned with the system. Uh, I can't tell from the picture um, whether Mark had uh, any simulated explosive belts on him. One of the silliest um, but serious uh, test articles that we did was an explosive fill and ball bearing fill um, undergarment sort of thing uh, that uh, strikes me as bad in, in many different ways. So um, built a custom system, showed that it worked, and the punchline to that joke was after we got it optimized to work with the physical curvature at 15 meters, um, they said, no, we mean 50 meters or something like that. Or maybe it was 15 feet, and then they said, no, we, need, uh, we mean 15 meters. The point is that we had um, built one that worked for a particular distance, and then they said, no, we want a different distance. And at the time, uh, that wasn't really feasible given the um, technology and the budget available. And so the, uh, it's a really interesting problem in the sense that uh, you can use this technology to focus um, the sound beam on a, a person, for example, and the person won't hear it because it's pointed, say, at their abdomen rather than at their ears, and then you'll get backscattering from um, whatever's underneath the surface and it's a machine learning play in the sense that you have to um, interpret those complicated signals that come back in order to make the call in real time of uh, weapon or no weapon. The, uh, uh, and so we developed this, a lot of the development work was done um, during the years when um, uh, explosive, in explosive devices at checkpoints was the issue. Um, the, uh, uh, and we uh, developed together with our um, uh, small, large company partners, and then passed it off to uh, uh, to them for um, systems integration and commercialization. We also did um, a whole sequence of really interesting simulations of this complicated nonlinear 3D scattering um, just after the time when the underwear bomber um, was an issue, and uh, uh, 
And so we did a whole sequence of simulations of um, different kinds of undergarments with different kinds of uh, explosive um, shapes inside them to see if we could um, get some particular um, analysis that allowed us to automatically detect those. Early on, uh, one of the applications that we worked on was uh, the sort of traffic stop scenario uh, where uh, uh, you want to, from some standoff distance, tell whether the person uh, has um, a hidden weapon or not. And the idea there is to try to uh, look for some characteristic scattering from, for example, gun barrel sorts of shapes or, or those kinds of things. Uh, lots of very interesting science with an important uh, application in society, both civilian and military applications, safety and security. Uh, and uh, this is the kind of thing that we often do in applied science. We're paying attention for changes in society that um, bring a new urgency to a problem that we hadn't thought was important before, and then all of a sudden it is. And it gives us an interesting reality check when we can take something that we know from another application, apply it to a new, suddenly important application, and see if we can help solve the problem. I'm Professor Mark Hinders, Applied Science Department at William & Mary, as.wm.edu.